powerful thing. Amen, amen. That's good, Janice, good. Uh, Brother Brian Rowland is going to preach for us tonight. I want you to pray for him. Folks, we've got a number of young men in our church now who have announced their calling to preach, and uh, they've stepped out and uh, stepped forward and said, Here I am, uh, Satan. I'm not going to fight this anymore. I'm going to preach. Amen. They need your prayers, and they need your support, because um, it, it would do everybody good in the church to give you about 10 minutes and let you preach. And then you get an idea of what it is to preach God's word. Amen. Because first time I preached, I sweat blood. Believe me, I did. God's got his hand on them, and I'm going to support them. And I want you to do the same thing. Please pray for them. All right, Brother Roland. God bless you, Brother. Amen. It's uh, good to be here tonight. There's a lot of places that, uh, uh, that you could be instead of here in the house of God. You could be, you know, drunk in some gutter, you know, stoned out of your mind, laying up underneath some bridge. But, but God, uh, in his infinite grace and his mercy, decided to bring me back to what I call my home, bring me back to, to this house of God. And uh, as many times as I've gotten, uh, uh, been able to, to preach on the radio and, and at other churches, there's just something about Temple Baptist Church that just <laughs> just makes you nervous. It does. It just it's, uh, At some point, it sits over there in the third or fourth row is brick wall, and uh, eventually it, it comes up and introduces itself to you. But uh, I've heard, I've heard uh, other analogies uh, uh, saying uh, trying to follow uh, Preacher Lawson's like a... Uh, it's like uh, trying to follow a John Deere tractor with a with a weed eater. Yes, that's right. Amen. <laughs> Amen. But, you know, sometimes that weed eater can get in places that that big John Deere tractor can't. And uh, and uh, I like uh, well, Brother Tony. Uh, uh, Tony said this morning, you know, he's tired of of these uh, <laughs> second and, and third string preachers. And, uh, and I was just. Uh, I wanted, wanted to thank him for that because they give me a give me a little bit of ammunition to, to come out with tonight because you know we got Jesus he's our uh, he's our coach you know he's the coach of this team and we know we've got an all star captain here with, uh, with with Pastor Lawson and but you no know, sometimes uh, uh, that uh, that all star first string you know preacher he needs to needs to take a breather you know and and so he's got to call on his uh, second and third stringers and. I just want to say, Brother Tony, uh, I believe God, he heard your prayer, and he answered your prayer, and instead of sending you a second or a third stringer, he reached way down into the barrel and grabbed a fourth stringer, praise God. And so you don't have to listen to the, the second or third stringer, but it's okay. You know, uh, don't, don't let your hearts be worried, fear not, because I've got the first string playbook. Amen. Amen. So, so if you have your Bibles... And hopefully uh, it's uh, the King James playbook here. Because uh, uh, if you don't have the King James Bible, you don't have uh, uh, this playbook that the Lord's given us, then, you know, we're not going to be on the same page. You know, our, our plays are, are not going to be in sync. You're going to zig when you need to zag. So make sure that you've got a King James Bible. Amen? So if you've got your Bibles, I'd like for you to turn to the book of James. And we're going to read... Starting in chapter number 3, verses 1 through 8. The holy inspired word of the living God says this. It says, My brethren, be not many masters, knowing that we shall receive the greater condemnation. For in many things we offend all. If any man offend not in word, the same is a perfect man and able also to bridle the whole body. Behold, we put bits in the horse's mouths that they may obey us, and we turn about their whole body. Behold, also the ships, which though they be so great and are driven of fierce winds, yet are they turned about with a very small helm, whithersoever the governor listeth. Even so, the tongue is a little member and boasteth great things. Behold, how great a matter a little fire kindleth. And the tongue is a fire, a world of iniquity. So is the tongue among our members, that it defileth the whole body, and setteth on fire the course of nature, and it is set on fire of hell. 
for every kind of beast and of birds and of servants, serpents and of things in the sea is tame and hath been tamed of mankind, but the tongue can no man tame. It is an unruly evil full of deadly poison. Father, I pray that you come down and do the preaching, Lord. I pray that you anoint my lips of clay, that you give me unction from on high. I pray, Lord, that you give me the words that you want spoken out to your people tonight, Lord. I, I, didn't, I didn't want to preach this message, Lord, but this is the message that, that you wanted to be preached. This is the message uh, that you gave uh, to my heart, Father. So please, Lord, I pray that you come down and hide me behind your cross and get this old fleshly uh, sinner out of the way and uh, feel your presence and speak to the hearts that need to be spoken to. And we'll give you all the praise and the honor and the glory. Uh, for in Jesus' name we pray, and in Jesus' name we ask these things. Amen and amen. And so we here we have the uh, the author of the book of James, and it's uh, been widely uh, uh, debated throughout the decades. Uh, traditionally, uh, of who actually wrote this book? Traditionally, most people say that it is uh, uh, James, the brother of Jesus. Uh, but uh, C.I. Schofield seems to think that it was James the Just, who was a, a pillar in the uh, church, uh, early church at Jerusalem. Uh, but however, whomever the author may have been, or who it was really written by, is just a forethought. Because what really matters here is that it was included into the canonization of Scripture. What matters here, it is the holy inspired word of the most high living God. Uh, now that being said, uh, the author of James here in chapter number 3 uh, gives a strong rebuke about the use of a person's tongue. Uh, so obviously, even way back when and the earliest churches started, there were issues among the church. There were issues among the brethren. Uh, so you know, even after 2,000 years, uh, we have Christians, you know, we, we sometimes believe, you know, we have arrived. You know, we have progressed so far. We've got all these beautiful buildings, you know, all these uh, uh, technologies that we have. And we sometimes uh, think that, you know, we have progressed so far uh, that we don't need to look at the instructions that the Word of God has given us. And so just like uh, 2,000 years ago, uh, there was a plague in the church of the, of the loose tongue. And so uh, just like the preacher was preaching this morning, he was preaching on uh, those stuff that the, uh, the devil fills your head and the thoughts and the intents of your heart. Oh, friends, there's a, a not only the thoughts and the intents of your heart and your head, uh, but the devil wants to use that tongue. And he wants to use it uh, to cause division and to cause strife amongst the brethren. And so uh, uh, we have uh, uh, the first part here in verse number one. I want you to look at this. It says, my brethren, and take note, it says, be not many masters, uh, knowing uh, that we shall receive of uh, the greater condemnation. Uh, for uh, in many things uh, we offend all. And if any man uh, offend not in word, the same is a perfect man. And be able also to bridle the whole body. We see here in verse 2 it says, Many things we offend all. You know, a lot of people are offended in today's snowflake age. A lot of people uh, in their political correctness craze uh, get offended, and it's sweeping across the nations. More and more uh, uh, things get defined as being offensive, as being defined as being hate speech. Uh, people are getting offended at the placement of the Ten Commandments in a government courthouse building. Uh, people are getting offended uh, because of the nativity scenes around Christmas time on public property. Uh, people are getting offended about even the, using the word Christmas. Christmas and to replace it with a, a happy holidays or a season's greetings. As a matter of fact, people are just offended by Christianity today. You know, just the other day, me and Brother Caleb Seals and, and a couple of other brothers, we went street preaching out in the market square and people were offended by us out there preaching. One, one lady in particular was so offended by us preaching that she had to come out and make a statement against us preaching the gospel. And she came out and she wanted to give a, a statement of politics, a political statement. And what she didn't realize was, was that we were not out there preaching of the Republican Party. We were not out there preaching the Democratic Party. We were out there preaching uh, Jesus Christ. We were preaching the gospel of our Lord and Savior. We were preaching of uh, the death, the burial, and the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. And she found that offensive. She came straight out of a bar, straight out of a bar to inform us uh, that she was a good Christian lady. 
And she wanted to know why that we as Christians voted Donald Trump into office. And that's when I had to, uh, to inform her again that, you know, we were preaching Jesus, not Donald Trump. Donald Trump is not what we preach. Jesus is what we preach. And before I could get a chance to get anything else out, she turned and walked away. But what I really wanted to ask her that day was if you are such a good Christian lady, if, you're such a, uh, if you believe everything that Jesus uh, uh, taught and did, you stand for, for the morals of, of, the, of the Christian lifestyle, then why would you want to vote, vote for a baby killer? Amen. You know, they want to take Christ out of the schools. They want to take, or they already have actually, but they want to, to completely remove any remnants of, of Christianity through our schools, through our public systems, through our governments, and they want to replace it with a Muhammad. There's uh, things going on right now, even in this country, in New Jersey, for example, where they're portraying uh, or teaching uh, Muhammad, and they're teaching Islam, and the seven pillars of Islam, into the public schools. It's in a world religion class, but they fail to include Christianity into this world religion class. And so it is okay to, to preach and teach as long as it's not Jesus. It's okay to, 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 to inform our children as long as it's not about Jesus Christ or Christianity. Back to verse number 2, it says, If any man defend not in word, the same is a perfect man and able to bridle the whole body. So to understand what James is saying here, we have to, to look back into verse 1. And I ask you to take note of be not many masters. See, James is saying that if you can control the tongue, you can control your whole body. You can control the actions that will rise up uh, from, from offenses that you might take. But there's not too many masters of this trait. And I know this isn't going to be a popular sermon. I know I'm not going to make too many friends with this one. Amen? Amen? But the Lord told me to preach this. He gave me this message, and I know his, his word will not return void. Amen. You know, our words can sometimes wound our friends, our brothers, our sisters, our family. Our words can drive a wedge and cause division in a church. Our words can wound other Christians and cause them to stop fellowshipping with others. Our words can wound so bad that it will cause a person to leave the church. It's that tongue. We have to control that tongue. You know, our words, our words are our testimony. And testimonies have been destroyed because of a loose tongue. What we fail to realize is, is that our words, our tongues, will offend God when they are used in the wrong way. God gave us our tongues to praise and to worship Him. That's what the proper use of our tongues is for. And so secondly, I want to talk to you about direction, the direction that that tongue should be going in, the direction that you need to, to take when using your tongue. And in verse 3 and 4, we have some great examples the Bible tells us, it says, Behold, we put bits in the horse's mouth that they may obey us. And when we turn about, and we turn about their whole body. You see, in verse number three, just try to imagine to get on a horse with no saddle or no reins to steer it. That horse is just going to go whichever way it wants to go. It's just going to be bucking wild. You know, it's just going to do, do what it pleases. And that's the same thing with our tongues. If we don't put the bridle on our tongues and we just let our tongues run loose, it's going to go wild. You know, it's, you know tongues gone wild, so to speak. You know, I mean, it's, and we can't, we can't have that in our church today. We need to be more mindful of that. You know, we, we, put the, we need a bit and we need the reins. We need to be able to control the direction that our tongue is, is going. Just like that horse without reins, it's going to go every which way except the way God wants to use it. You know, he wants us to lift up the name of Jesus. And the Bible tells us that when we lift up the name of Jesus, that he'll draw all men unto us. Or unto him, I'm sorry. He'll draw all men unto him.
This, uh, but we can't master the tongue if we don't give Jesus the reins. If we give Jesus the reins, he'll master our tongues for us. But James, he, James, he didn't stop there. He gave us yet another example in verse number 4. It says, Behold, also the ships, which though they be so great, and are driven of fierce winds, yet are they turned about with a very small helm, whithersoever the governor listeth. You know, that, that little helm, that small little helm turns that ship. It turns that ship left or right, just like the, our little tongue will turn our, our directions left or right. It'll turn our attitudes left or right. It'll turn our perceptions left or right. But you know what? If you turn that helm too far to the left, or if you turn that helm too far to the right, when you begin, you, you begin to go off course. You begin to go off the course that God had set for you to go. And eventually, if you keep going too far left or too far right, uh, you're going to be heading back in the opposite direction that God wanted you to go. You'll be turned completely around and you won't be going forward with Him, but you'll be going backwards. Amen. If you keep turning left and you don't let off that helm, what's going to happen? You're going to go in circles. Amen. And that's what, you know, our tongues can do. We'll just be talking, talk, 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 talk. You know, we can talk the talk, but do we walk the walk? So we have to keep our helm straight and true. We have to talk straight tonight, Christians. We have to talk straight, saints. We can't let our tongues go left or right. We have to keep moving forward with our walk with God. We have to move forward with our fellowship with one another. We can't let words cause division amongst us. Not now, not ever, not in this day and age. In this day and age, we need to rely on one another. Amen. We need each other more than ever in today's day and age. Right. Today, the world is truly against us. Today, Amen. the world truly wants to see us destroyed. Amen. And when there is division amongst us, when we're uh, talking bad about one another, Amen. we're doing their job for them. We can't let our words cause division. We just can't do it. Amen. You know, we're, we're more than conquerors through Jesus Christ. And we have victory through Jesus Christ. And Jesus can and will give us victory over our tongues if we give him the reins. Amen. Thirdly, I want to look at it's the consequences. How great a matter a little fire kindleth. We'll read verses 5 through 8 again. It says, Even so the tongue is a little member and boasteth the great things. Behold, how great a matter a little fire kindleth. And the tongue is a fire, a world of iniquity. So is the tongue among our members, that it defileth the whole body, and setteth on fire the course of nature, and is set on the fire of hell. Amen. For every kind of beast, and of birds, and of serpents, and of things in the sea is tamed, and hath been tamed of mankind. But the tongue can no man tame. It is truly, it is an, an unruly evil, full of deadly poison. How great! A matter, a little fire can kindle it. You know, I started to think about that, and I started to meditate on that verse just a little bit. And what God had brought to my mind was those Gatlinburg fires. You know, those Gatlinburg fires, they were started by two, two innocent little kids just out there just playing with matches. Just something, just you know, something trivial. They didn't have malice in their, in the, you know, in their head. They didn't do it on purpose. They did, they didn't set out to cause a great destruction or to cause loss of life and property, and 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 things that that they owned. But what they did was that they started a little fire, and in those winds, those winds they they picked up, those winds picked up, and then before you know what, that little fire that was started. 
turned into a wildfire. That little fire that was started started to, to uh, pick up some, some dryness here and there, started to pick up a, a little bit of dry leaves over here or a little bit of a dry brush over there. And before you know it, that wind started to blow. And when that wind started to blow, it's the fire started to pick up. And when it started to pick up and sweep across uh, the, that mountainside, uh, people, people uh, their homes were destroyed. People's lives were lost. Uh, people's property uh, was damaged. But that's not, what they, that's not what they intended to do. And the same thing is happening to us right now. The same thing is happening. Uh, uh, the, the tongue is a fire. And the tongue, when it gets to, to hit some of that dry ground here in the church, when that, when that dry kindle starts to, to spark a little bit of fire, and the devil, he'll come in and he'll blur, start to blow on that fire, start to get those winds to blow. And then that fire is going to pick up because they're dry spiritually. And when that fire catches fire and it starts to go, it's going to set its course through the entire church until there's nothing left. And then we're all burnt down. The point is, is that it starts off with a little rumor here or there. It starts off with a little backbiting, a little envy, a little jealousy, so on and so forth, until that little flame catches some spiritual dry ground and catches fire. And turns into a wildfire. Brother so and so said this about me. Sister so and so wore this awful outfit. You know, Amen. That's how it gets started. That's how it's done. Until there is, until it becomes so divisive that there's no communion and there's a no fellowship in the church and a house divided against itself, it cannot stand. Verse 8 tells us that the tongue can no man tame. It is an unruly evil, full of deadly poison. Jesus tells us this in the book of Matthew, if you want to turn with me. Matthew chapter 15. And we'll read verses 11. And we'll jump down to verse 17 after that to finish it off. Matthew 15. Verse 11, the Bible says, It's not that which goeth into the mouth that defileth a man, but that which cometh out of the mouth, this defileth a man. Amen. Verse 17 says, Do not ye yet understand that whatsoever entereth in at the mouth goeth into the belly, and is cast out into the draught. But those things which proceed out of the mouth come forth from the heart, and they defile the man. For out of the heart proceed evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, fornication, thefts, false witness, and blasphemes. These are the things which defile a man. I believe that this is the biggest tool that our enemy uses against us. James knew this all too well, and he gives us yet another warning about this in the Scripture. In verses 14 and 16, back in James chapter 3, verse 14 says, But if ye have bitter envying and strife in your hearts, glory not, and lie not against the truth. This wisdom descendeth not from above, but is earthly, sensual, devilish. For where envying and strife is, there is confusion in every evil work. You know, friends, God is not the author of confusion. Satan is that author of confusion. That's the devil. And you know what happens when you take the D off of the devil? You get evil. You get evil. Envy, strife, confusion. The devil wants us to be at each other's throats. He wants us to tear each other down. He wants us to divide. He wants us to con uh, uh, he wants to come in to conquer this congregation uh, to the point to where nobody wants the fellowship. But there is a hope. There is hope today. There is hope tonight to avoid this travesty, to avoid this devastation. There is a way to combat the devil and his tactics. And lastly. I'm going to give you the remedy. The remedy here in verse 17 and 18, 
The Bible tells us this. It says, But the wisdom that is from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, and easy to be entreated, full of mercy and good fruits, without partiality and without hypocrisy. And the fruit of righteousness is sown in the peace of them that make peace. The wisdom that is from above. You know that wisdom that is from above? You know where that comes from? Well, besides from coming above, it says the fear of the Lord. In the book of Psalms, it says the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Pure, peaceable, <laughs> gentle, and easy to be entreated. Full of mercy and good fruits. Without partiality. Without hypocrisy. Friends, the wisdom from above is the Word of God. That's what He wants us to live our lives by. He left us His living Word to guide us and to conform us into Him. He left us His Word to be a shining light in this world of darkness. He left us a, 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 a His Word to give us an example of what our words should be. Hey, our words uh, uh, should be His words. Our wisdom should be His wisdom. For His Word is pure. His Word is peaceable. His Word is gentle. His Word is full of mercy. His Word is righteousness. You know, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and all things were made by Him. And without Him, there was not anything made that was made. And in Him was the light. In Him was that light that lighteth every man that come into the world. And that Word, that Word became flesh, and that Word dwelt among us. And we beheld His glory, the glory as of the only of, uh, begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Amen. Amen. Friends, Jesus is glorified when our words make peace instead of poison. Yeah. Amen. Jesus is honored when our words uplift each other instead of tearing one another down. When we give Jesus the reins to our hearts, when we give him uh, the reins to our tongues, yes. the book of Matthew tells us this. It says, Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. You know, it's not that hard to live by this book, to live by this playbook that he's given us. Sometimes the roads are rocky. Yes, I understand. Sometimes, you know, there's, there's trials and temptations. Sometimes that we mess up and slip and fall along the way. But there's always grace and there's always mercy. Amen. His mercy endureth forever. Amen. Friends, we have to give Jesus the reins to our hearts. Amen. We have to. Yeah. Because I don't want to be the one whose words wounded somebody so bad it discouraged them yeah. from doing God's work. I don't want that on my conscience. I don't want that in my heart. I don't want to stand before my God and ask why I said the things that I said to discourage His work of being done. I don't want to be the one whose words made somebody quit going to church. I don't want to be the one whose words made somebody quit on God. Friends, that's all we have is each other, is the person next to us, to the left and to the right of us. And no, but none of us are perfect. We're all sinners. And we're all saved by grace. And we've all been shown the mercy of the Lord or we wouldn't be sitting here because we all deserve to go to hell. But Jesus paid an ultimate price so that we wouldn't have to. He paid the price on Calvary to save a wretched sinner as I. And I pray... I really pray that this message has spoke to someone tonight. I really didn't want to preach this message. I had another message about Joseph and the pits and trials, and it would have been a really uplifting message, but I have to obey the Lord. And so I really hope and pray that somebody somewhere, either on the Internet or here in the congregation, got something out of it tonight. Father, I pray that you use what I've said, Lord. Lord, I'm just the mailman. I'm just delivering the message. I pray that you'll do your work and we'll give you all the honor and the glory and the praise.
And we all love you, Jesus. In Jesus' name, amen.